raindrops are falling on my head And just like the guy's feet are too big for his bed Nothing seems to fit Those raindrops are falling on my head And they keep falling Raindrops keep falling on my head But that doesn't mean my eyes will soon Stop the rain by complaining Because I'm free Nothing's worrying me Wow. What happened to my TV? <laughs> what happened? Praise the Lord. We're having, oh, there it goes. There we go. We're going to do good this morning, everybody. Take a big sigh. Don't have to be overwhelmed. How many of you ever been overwhelmed in your life? Do you know what uh, whelmed means? You don't know what it means? Aren't you glad I, I tell you what whelmed means? Whelmed means to be completely submerged. Submerged under something. And so when you're overwhelmed, it means you are completely submerged in a set of circumstances that has you and that you just don't know what to do or what to say. I think a lot of us, what we've learned to do in our society today, we've learned to wear masks. And most of us, we go to, hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. Meanwhile, behind that mask, you might be overwhelmed with your marriage. You might be overwhelmed with an elderly parent whose health is failing. You might be overwhelmed with your marriage or your children. You might be overwhelmed with a sense of loneliness. You might be overwhelmed with a sense of guilt, perhaps some sins you've done and things of that nature. And it's just overwhelming. It's like, God, I, I feel like I'm swimming, and I can't seem to get above my head above water. I'm, I'm growing tired, and I'm, I'm doggy paddling. I'm here trying to wade my way through it, and it's very difficult. And you see, that is part of it. And one of the big elements in being overwhelmed is the emotion of fear, terror. In fact, I, I think our society today is very akin and acknowledges the power that fear has in being overwhelmed. Like you feel like you cannot cope. I want to encourage you to go last week. We spoke about this last week. We started our series. And today I wanted to, to continue to go forward. How do we get free? How do we start being overwhelmed to becoming overcomers? From overwhelmed to overcomers. And so we're going to look at that today. If you want to open your Bibles, please, to Philippians chapter 4. Starting at verse 4. I love how the Bible just gets right to it. And right here, the Apostle Paul is talking. By the way, the Apostle Paul didn't have the best set of circumstances. It wasn't like he was living in a, a wonderful California or Hawaiian community. He wasn't living in San Diego. He wasn't living the good life. He wasn't driving around in a nice car. He didn't have everyone that likes him. didn't have a book contract, television contract. He wasn't on MS, NBC or NBC Good Morning Today or whatever they have. He was going through a difficult time. He was being persecuted. He was being lied about. He experienced tremendous persecution. And so he's talking to the church of the Galatians who began, we did a whole series on Galatian, the Galatian church, who began in faith and began to work to works. But then he gets to a point telling them how they should deal and how they should manage their life. Now, what's so wonderful about the Apostle Paul is the Apostle Paul did not have an easy life. Do you ever meet somebody that, I mean, everything is going phenomenal. I mean, their kids are in Ivy League schools. Their, their, their spouse makes more money than they know what to do with. Uh, they have vacation homes and they're just good looking. They're spiritual when they pray. You feel like it should be uh, put in a book. I mean, they're just amazing. You're like, well, and, and they're telling you, hey, just trust God. Yeah, be quiet. You don't know what I'm going through. But the Apostle Paul, he was shipwrecked, beaten up, left for dead. I mean, he went through such tremendous difficulties. If there's anyone in the Bible that could talk about overcoming difficulties, it'd be the Apostle Paul. Except for Jesus, of course. And here he goes, and he's talking about how you and I can overcome difficult sets of circumstances and rise above them and get to the place where what happens on this celestial plane does not dictate our actions and our moods, 
that we can be transcendent. We can move beyond what this earth gives us and live in a realm and live in an atmosphere that cannot be changed or bothered. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a great idea. Otherwise, you will become like a soccer ball being kicked around by sets of circumstances. And your life will be based upon what happens to you and what you're able to do. God has something so much better for us because we and I were not made to live our lives by ourselves and for ourselves if we do that. We will either live in a mirage of thinking all things are okay, and then one day we'll be so overwhelmed. Or, if you're lucky, you'll have an opportunity to find out you don't have what it takes, and you'll be overwhelmed so he can take the helm. Well, let's look at the Apostle Paul says here, and I love what he says here. And uh, I know you're, if you're depressed or upset or angry or frustrated or fearful or whatever, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Now, if you see that, and let's say you're going through a difficult time, and let's just say right now your spouse, you just got handed divorce papers that were dropped off at your office place, and everyone at work saw what was that, and they know what it was. You were served papers. And all of a sudden, this well-meaning Christian comes up to you and goes, Rejoice in the Lord! And again, I say, Rejoice! What would you do? You'd probably spill your coffee upon them and say, Go to heaven. Um, but sometimes, maybe in the church, you've experienced that. Maybe you've experienced some difficult times, and a well-meaning, lovely, phenomenal Christian comes up to you, and they quote you this type of scripture. Rejoice! And then what you feel like is, I am a complete failure as a Christian. I can't even rejoice. Or I know other people that go through something like that. They go, praise God, I have cancer. Praise God, my cat got run over by a car. Praise God. Whatever. I'm, not, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. But never, nevertheless, and they, it is, they're thanking God for everything. Praise God. All the, and all, God causes all these things to happen to me. And they're, just, and they're like, be, be quiet. You're, you're not, what world are you living in? You never see anyone in the Bible rejoicing over bad things happening to them, ever. But you see the psalmist, you see Jesus, you see the Apostle Paul. Although I am in dire circumstances, I can, have, I can rejoice. Although I'm pressed down, I'm not destroyed. Although I'm crushed, I'm not left abandoned. I have an eternal buoy inside of me. And as much as the world and the devil and circumstances try to submerge me under the water, I keep popping up to the top because I have the buoyancy of who I am and Jesus Christ, and you can't sink it. My friends, that's a place you and I need to learn. Now, I was joking with the worship team today that I think the next series I'm going to preach on is how to handle things when everything is going perfect and everything is just wonderful. And as the Lego movie goes, everything is awesome. How do you handle that? Because maybe then it'll be better. But let me tell you, I had no idea that when I'd be t preaching in this series, there'd be uh, a number of events that have taken place beyond my control that would have to have me to learn to not be overwhelmed and to learn to trust God in it. So... I just want to let you know that this sermon comes today not from a theoretician in an ivy tower someplace sipping a cup of coffee and a biscotti. And, and, and I also don't pretend, by the way, to understand some of the pain that you've been through because compared to most people in the world, I got it pretty good. But there are times where you can feel overwhelmed. You're being submerged and you're trying to swim and you're wondering how you're going to do it. Apostle Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. And you know what's even more emphatic about this rejoice? It's in the command form. It's not a suggestion. It's saying rejoice. And then you say, and let me make it very, very clear. Never in the Bible do they say deny reality. Never. Despite reality, we have a joy. And you're going to hear me say this verse almost all the time in Hebrews. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. We have to learn to get to the place to to rejoice in the Lord. Well, how do you rejoice in the Lord always? And again, I say rejoice. 
You know, you can have joy and sadness. I've had the weird emotions of being at a funeral, at a horrific death, a, a premature death of somebody. I'm literally crying out and feel anguish in my heart. And, and, and at the same time, I have joy because I know the person's in a better place. It, it, it's a weird emotion. It, it's, but in the middle of the, of the anguish and the tears and the difficulty and God, why did this happen? We don't understand why this happened. Inside of me or inside of you, there's a, there's a buoyancy. That's something that's popping you up above being overwhelmed, above being submerged. It's the promises of Jesus Christ. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, he, said, he finds it necessary. And when they repeat something in Scripture, especially in the Greek language and in Hebrew language, it means something. And again, I will say, rejoice. Then he says this, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. The gentleness of the Lord is at hand. Well, how are we supposed to get to the place where we can do this? Let's continue to read the Scriptures and we'll go through it. He says, be anxious for everything and everything complain. And tell your neighbor with a Facebook and a tweet. And complain and let your request be known to everybody except for God. No, that's not what it says. It says, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let's continue to read and we'll break it down a little further so you have the context. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever the things are true, whatever the things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So the Apostle Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells us about being overwhelmed, tells us to rejoice, and then gives us an antidote and a formula how to do it. Now, I know some of you get kind of weary of formulas, and so do I. But this is not just a formula. This is the Word of God. The Word of God is sharpened in any two-edged sword, dividing between soul and spirit. It judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so what can happen is if you let the Word of God go in you, the Holy Spirit will be like a surgeon that will cut you in the right way and repair and replace and help you to get to a better place. And this is where God wants us to be today. So what do we do? How do we get this thing first? To find peace and joy, we need to make everything a matter of prayer. Everything. You mean a parking space at the mall? Sure. Why not? Do you mean if, my, if, if a family member is, is dying? Yes. Do you mean if I can't find my keys? Absolutely for that one. Okay? Make everything a matter of prayer. God cares for you. You can call him daddy. He cares about the most minute details, and he cares about the big ones. It's not like God is so busy up in heaven, I don't want to bother him with this one. No. He says, cast all of your cares upon me. For he cares for you, the Bible says in 1 Peter. So make everything a matter of prayer. Be anxious for nothing. I love what, uh, I'll continue to read. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. And supplication. What does supplication mean? It means request. It means pouring out your heart to God. It means, as the psalmist did and as King Hezekiah did, he opened a, it opened a letter before the Lord. 
and said, Lord, look at this letter that has been given to me as a threat. He opened it before the Lord, and he told the Lord what he was going through. When Hezekiah was told, get your affairs in order, you're going to die, he turned his face to the wall, and he wept. And he what? He told. He had supplication. God, have grace upon me. What will be is what will be. No one, no man or great woman in the Bible has ever just said, what will be is what will be. That's not what God would have us to ever do. We're supposed to participate in the unleashing of the kingdom of heaven and that we can never change the character of God, but we can change where God puts his hands by our prayers. Make no mistake. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Not moaning and groaning. We'll get to that in a few moments. Let your requests be made known to God. I like what Corey Tamboon says. She says this. She was persecuted in World War II. Tremendous woman. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strengths. Worry is one of the, the most useless emotions in the world. Worry begins to evoke fear, anxiety, stress, and you begin to feel overwhelmed even more. And the more you worry, the worse it gets. Have you ever found that? I, I, I don't think I've ever seen worry ever help me. It's almost like, it's almost like punching a wound. You know, you, 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 you know they, they go to the doctor and they set your arm. It's been broken. And it's like, oh, will my arm ever get better? Will my arm ever get better? Ah, it feels worse. My arm's not getting better. Man, with my arm. And it's just the more you whack it, the worse it gets. It's like one of the most useless things that you can do is worry. It's, it's a useless emotion. Now, it's okay for the dashboard to go off and go, okay? It's okay to do that. And by the way, that's a whole other topic we're going to probably have to get to next week. But worry does not, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strengths. Well, what happens? It says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. So everything. God cares about every little thing. He cares about every little thing. And by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. It's not this crazy, well, thank you, God, that I just lost my job and I'm being thrown in the street. Praise God, I just lost my middle finger. Praise God, I just lost my leg. Praise God. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is in the middle of it, you can say, God, I don't understand what's going on. But I thank you that when this thing is done, I win in you. I want to thank you that I am so secure, nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. Nothing, not height, nor depth, nor anything past, nor present, nor angels or demons will be able to separate me from the love of Christ Jesus. And we begin to remind ourselves of who we are and say, yes, I am going through a difficult season here. I may be losing this battle, but I win the war. And so we have to have supplication with thanksgiving. I tell you right now, when you begin to have negativity, you know what negativity does? Negativity opens a door and you invite the enemy to come in. If you're trying to clean your house, if you have children and the house is a mess, how wise would it be to call a local farmer and tell him to bring a bunch of pigs to your house and say, can you help me out here? I want to clean my house. And they let a bunch of pigs go in your house. You think that might help? (laughs) Okay. When you and I are not thankful and resent things and complain. You know what we're doing? We're, in li- we're allowing the pigs, the enemy, to come in our lives. And what he'll do is whatever you're going through, it will become worse. Guaranteed. So with Thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You know, I love, um, this is what I've also found as well. 
The more you complain, the higher plane of pain. The more you complain, the higher plane of pain. You are literally digging yourself into a ditch of despair with complaining. It doesn't help. We have to find solutions. We have to find solutions. Now, listen, I understand something. I, I, I need to stop here for a moment, and I need to go to a footnote in what we're talking about right now. Because I know some of you watching or some of you here right now uh, have been told this and you come to church and you feel so guilty because you struggle with depression or you struggle with anxiety and you've tried everything you know how to do and you still struggle with it and you feel like the most loserist, if that's even a word, you feel like the most loserist, new Bucci terminology, loserist, biggest loser on the, fat place, on the face of the planet or the worst one in the church, what kind of Christian am I? I struggle with depression or anxiety. I have no faith. I might as well throw it up and let it go. Listen, I want to make something abundantly clear to you. How many of you, imagine you have high blood pressure. And you have, uh, also you have clogging of the arteries. And you had to put a stent inside of you. And you have to take medication to lower your blood, your cholesterol and lower your blood pressure. Oh, what a terrible person. You, you have no faith in God. Would that, right, would that happen? Do you realize there's certain people out there that struggle with a chemical balance in their minds and that sometimes it's appropriate to get help with that? However, let me preface this. If you do have high blood pressure and you do have heart disease, you don't go to the Golden Corral. You don't go to Texas Road Steakhouse and get a T-bone steak. You don't get a baked potato and put bacon butter, and cream cheese, and you certainly don't have those buttered rolls before they serve you the food. Right? You don't do that, right? You, you have to what? You have to cooperate with what the doctor says. And I will tell you right now that if you have a heart trouble, and if you have an emotional trouble, whatever it is, there are things that you can do to help God along the way. There was a dear friend of ours in two churches ago, <laughs> actually the last church we were in, I'll say it because I've asked her permission. Her name was Gail Castle, great woman of God, and they found a hole in her heart. And so the doctor said, for the rest of your life, you're going to have to take medication. And so she said, okay, I'll do that. And every day she took a little grape juice and a little bit of crackers, and she took communion. She says, by his stripes, I am healed. And she took a communion, and as she's done with communion, guess what she did? She took the medication. Lord, let this medication do what it's intended to do and what it's not protect me from. And she took it every day, every day, every day. She thanked God for her healing, and she, and she took the medication. Thank God for her healing and took the medication. She cooperated with the doctor. She did all the things, the dietary issues, all that would happen. A year goes by, and she just senses, I want another test, doctor. And they had another test, and guess what? There was no hole in her heart. <laughs> now listen, for those of you who are struggling with joy, Relax, okay? God understands if you're, if you're frustrated. And for those of you that have no idea what it's like to be depressed or anxious and all that, the Bible says, woe is the person that has a broken spirit. It's even worse than a broken body. You know, and let me just help you guys here this morning because I think sometimes the church has been the worst place for this. Not this church, but other churches. Okay? We all, well, have more faith. Come on. And we just have no, listen, if you have a stomach flu, Let's say you have a stomach virus and you're vomiting. And let's suppose you go to someone's house and they have the, they have the Iron Chef there, okay? And they had this amazing Thanksgiving spread with the most beautiful turkey, pumpkin pies, mashed potatoes, hamburgers, hot dogs, and bacon, okay? Uh, just amazing. And you're saying, come on, look at the beautiful food. How can you not want to eat? What's wrong with you? Come on, eat. Would you do that to somebody that had a stomach virus? No. You have mercy upon them. Yes, the food is good, but this person needs to get healed. I need to say that because I recognize the fact when I say rejoice always and all this, you're thinking, oh, great. What a blow to me. Listen, what I can say is this. We need to adjust our lives and our thinking to the heavens. Our, what happens in the mind eventually programs the soul. And what's programmed in the soul gets into the spirit. And what gets into the spirit controls everything else. You can get better 
and you should thank God for your healing. Because ultimately, we're all going to be healed one day. And so you can say, thank you, Father, that I'm being healed of this situation. I just needed to say that today because I recognize that with something like this being said, it can be almost like a punch in the head <laughs> with this. It really is difficult. Make everything come out of a prayer and get some perspective and be thankful. Understand what is going on ultimately. Remind yourself of the truth. Get some perspective. Thank God for all that he's done. Do you have a roof over your head? Do you have a car to drive? Did you, you know, do you have water to drink? I need a little segue to do that. I teach you that in speech class. Okay. <laughs> Thank God for all that he has done. You see, what happens is when you and I are thankful, guess what it does? It kicks out the pigs. It kicks out the enemy. And what it does, it invites the heavenly courts in your life. You're inviting the Holy Spirit to have greater prominence. You are opening doors in your home of your spirit and saying, come into this room. Come into this room. I thank you, God. I don't understand what's going on, but I thank you, God. You understand. I thank you that in my weakness, you are strong. I'm going to trust you, Father. I don't understand what's going on. I feel terrible, Lord. I don't think I can even go further, but I thank you, Father. Despite how I feel, my reality is not your reality. And you thank God. When you do that, you swing open the doors. And you allow his presence and his spirit to come with you. Make every matter a prayer. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and thanksgiving. Being thankful, refusing to be negative. Let your request be made known to God. He doesn't want you to oh, just forget about it. Don't, don't deal with don't deal with it. Don't, just forget about it. Just praise God. What do I that? No, just praise God. I don't care what you have. I had one person said this before, um, and this is kind of funny. I used it before, but it's it's true. I had a person that had the flu. What's going on? Oh, oh, nothing. I'm praise God. I don't have the flu. You should do it. No, I don't. I thought, no, I'm a praise God. I'm over it. I mean, that's silly, right? Yes, I got the flu. Boo-hoo, okay? I'm going to now do what I have to do to get over the flu. And so you thank God that you can get over it. So with Thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That's what he wants to do. So make it known. Have the right perspective on things. Realize that what's happening here is not forever, but it's for, t for that. And then the small one, which I didn't make big enough. <laughs> Redirect your thoughts and retrain them. Redirect your thoughts and retrain them. I like what McGinnis says. And McGinnis is a psychologist. That's what he wrote. He said, if we could, this is what he found. In this book called The Power of Optimism, this is what he found. He said 40% of the things worried about were things that were likely never to happen. He found that 12% of his worries concerned criticism from others that didn't matter anyway. He found that 10% of worries were about his health, and he was ready to do the best to stay healthy. And he also found that only 8% of the things he worried about were legitimate causes of worry. McGinnis writes, if we could eliminate our worries by 92%, we'd be well upon our way. We often worry about stuff that we should not worry stuff about. How do we redirect our thoughts? We have to retrain ourselves. Do you know what worry is? Worry is meditation. Think about it. You get a call from the doctor. Maybe your, your parents call you and say, they found a growth. They took a biopsy. We're going to have to wait a month until I find out what it is or a week. What happens in that week waiting for the biopsy results? It's worse than the disease. You think of every possible angle of what could go wrong and what the implications could be. Or they say, next Friday, the company is going to have a cutback. We're going to be handing out pink slips. But we're not going to tell you who it's going to be. How's that week go for you? Yeah, every single scenario you think of, don't you? That's called meditation. Worry is meditation. So how are we to redirect your thoughts and retrain them? Well, I'm so glad you do ask that question. Because the Bible has it right here. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the what? Truth, I am the life. 
whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, probably means you don't need to watch too much news. Think about the good that's going on. Find the good. Well, I can't find any good. Well, guess what? If you don't know what the good is, read the good news. You know what the good news is? The New Testament, the Bible. Okay? Whatever things are lovely. Now, what kind of movies are you watching? What kind of books are you reading? Why are you reading about some woman killing some guy in a romance novel at the beach? Why are you watching these horrific soap operas? Why are you filling your mind with music that is so depressing? I never forget after having a breakup of a relationship, playing the sappy Chicago song. I don't want to live without your love. I could never find a face a day. You know what I took? I took that CD. I literally did. I threw it out the car window. I know I shouldn't have littered. I didn't need that. You know, why are you going to hear you're no good? You're no good, baby. You're no good. And why do you want to hear that, right? The world's so negative. Why do you want to hear these politicians destroy, just destroy each other? I, you know, I don't have time to hear you badmouth each other. I want to hang out with people that are positive. If you have negative friends and, oh, there's no jobs out there today. You know, there's a bunch of Eeyores in your life. Get rid of the Eeyore and get the Tiggers in your life. Hi, everybody. You know, you get that guy that bounces on his tail. Oh, things are so bad in this country. Oh, the, you know, the country's going to hell. Oh, it's terrible what's happened, the political situation. You know what I say? Praise God. We have a chance to make a difference. Oh, right? Oh, we're in New England. It's the, it's the, it's the most spiritually dry place in the United States of America. According to George, George Barna, the church in America is the, is the coldest and the most irreligious is of New England. And I would have to say to that, praise God, because we have a chance to make a difference. Amen? Boy, that's not very good. Amen? Okay. Or pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are a good report, if there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate. So what's the opposite of worry? Meditation on what's good, what's pure, what's holy. Do you mean I have to put on K-Love? If K-Love works, then put it on. They're not saying about how bad things are. Put on positive music. These musicians are learning suicide. Watch half of them. Don't listen to the stuff. It's gonna, if, it's, if it's negative, don't listen to it. I like the music. The music's negative. You've got to brainwash yourself with the truth. And that's why it's important to find positive friends. You have negative friends. What are you doing in the tomorrow? I'm busy. What are you doing? Not spending time with you. What happens if you're married to Eeyore? Get a Tigger stuffed animal and put it in a bed and pray to God it rubs off on them. I don't know. Find some positive people to hang out with. Begin to tell yourself the truth. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. In my weakness, he is strong. Although I am overwhelmed, oh God, I'm going to look to you. But don't do it by yourself. God has called us to be a body. He says, Bible says in Ephesians 4, build each other up in love and in Christ. You can't build each other up if there's no each other. Is there any each others of the body of Christ in your life? Or is it just a Sunday platitude? Hey, how you doing? Praise God. It's hot and humid today. It sure is. I can't wait for winter. I think when winter comes. Boy, it's a lot of snow. I can't wait for summer. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about each other. If you don't have each other in your life, then you're missing out on the body of Christ helping you to overcome. The Bible says building each other up in love. You can't build each other up if there's no each other. So, we need to pray. Supplication. Ask God for help. Okay? Change your perspective. Be thankful. Retrain your mind and get around people that can make a difference. And meditate on these things. If you have, you know what I did for a period of time? I wrote declarations out. Literally wrote declarations. I am a child of God. 
You know what I do almost every single day? I pray Genesis 12, 2 and 3. I pray, I pray the prayer of Jabez, and I pray it almost every day over myself. I declare the truth. This is, you have to declare the truth, learn the truth, live in the truth, whatever it takes, get the truth in you. Meditate on these things and the things which you have learned. How do you learn? You got to study. Well, that's works. Yeah. There's some works in faith. You're not saved by works, but works help your faith get stronger. Does that make sense? Okay. Learned and received and heard and saw in me. These do, and the God of peace will what? Be with you. I love what it also says here. If I can find it. Hallelujah. I was going to say, and the God of peace. I don't know where it is. Uh -huh, okay. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. So the first part, be anxious for nothing. Prayer and thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. What happens after that? And the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. Well, what? It will guard. I don't have what it takes. Well, welcome to the club. How do you want the peace of God to guard your mind? That's a good idea. Will guard your mind and hearts through Jesus Christ. Listen, guys, I know it's difficult sometimes. And I'm not pretending life is easy. And I, I, I need to say one closing thought, if that's possible for me to do today. Change your perspective. Realize, stop thinking this is heaven. The earth is not heaven. Your spouse is not Jesus Christ. And neither are you. You're not perfect. I want to say this this morning because I need to. There was a time. I'm going to ask the worship team to make their way up. There was a time where I hated church. I literally hated going to church. I thought it was a bunch of hypocrites. I thought people were just judgmental, condemning. I saw a lot of hypocrisy in the church because I grew up in the church and I saw a lot of bad things. And I got fed up with it. I used to drive by a church and get sick to my stomach. You know what saved me from that? I read the Bible. <laughs> then I realized from Genesis to Revelation, it's full of people who are imperfect, who are serve a perfect God. Stop trying to make people into God and let God be God and people be people. When you look at the church as Christ is the head and not body as the head, it will help you. You cut yourself some slack and help other people and say, I'm not saying we allow stuff to happen. But what I am saying is you need to change your perspective on things. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, think on these things. Let's pray. Well, Father, I want to thank you so much that you're a good God. You're a good father. And, Father, we thank you you do not leave us as orphans, but you sent us your word. That your word is a light unto our path and that your word is life. And, Father, we recognize the fact that the word, we can cleanse our minds with the word. We know it says in according to Ephesians 5, husbands, wash your wife with the word. So, Father, we know that we can wash ourselves with the word. We can meditate on the word and we can find ourselves changed by the word. And, Father, I pray right now that you'd forgive us for being negative, for being a complaining people. Lord, I pray that we would learn to rejoice in all things. Lord, that we would meditate on what's good. That we'd be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, we'll make our requests known to you. And we thank you that the God of peace will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. So, Father, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever good report, Father, I ask in Jesus' name that we would take to heart what we've heard today, that we begin, Father, to meditate on these things. And Lord, I pray for those that are struggling right now, those that are feeling overwhelmed and they feel like they can't cope. Lord, I pray right now hope would rise up in them. With every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a question. You know, if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, you don't have that buoy that gets you out of being submerged in circumstances. There's no flotation device. There's no life saver there. You'll be swallowed by the sea of worry, swallowed by sin, swallowed by your circumstances. There's only one life, life preserver out there. There's only one lifesaver, and that's Jesus Christ. Because he became one of us, fully God, fully man, came to be our rescuer. Have you let Jesus rescue you? Have you completely let go? 
of the floating debris that's keeping you up and afloat. Let go of it and swam to the life preserver of Jesus and trusted that he will keep you afloat and save you. Have you done that yet? If you haven't, today can be your day. If you want to pray quietly in your own heart after me, Lord Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I ask you to take away all my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to follow you all the days of my life. Fill me now, I pray. And today I declare you are God, and I will serve you in Jesus' name. With every head bowed, say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. Just say, Pastor, anyone say today, Pastor, I prayed that prayer today. For the first time, thank you. Anyone else, thank you. Anyone else here this morning say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer? Okay. If you look up for a second, and these connection cards uh, on the other side that says your name. And on the bottom it says, I accepted Christ today as my Savior for the first time, or I have recommitted my life today. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make the way. You all stand if you could. We're going to have a closing, uh, closing song. Yeah, this I believe. We're going to sing this, I believe, at the very end there. And if you could just come up. If you need prayer for anything at all, we want to pray with you. We want to help. you. want to encourage you. Listen, we're all in this together. Remember, you need each other. You can't be built up without each other. He made us specifically for that reason. Okay, everybody? So let's do that. I believe. This is the chorus. Thank you. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe, I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. you, John. Amen. Listen, we want to leave these open for you. you. need prayer for anything at all. Otherwise, we hope to see you at the baptisms at 1 o'clock at Lake Quasi. Otherwise, guys, God bless you.